If you would like to sound smarter and be smarter, then this lesson is for you because I'm going to tell you 10 nouns to help you do just that. Welcome to today's lesson, which is a vocabulary lesson. Many of you out there have said you would like to learn more advanced vocabulary words, and that's what these 10 nouns are. They're not only going to help you sound smarter, but they're going to help you more accurately express your, your thoughts, opinions, and ideas. They also happen to be 10 of my favorite nouns. So as I go over these nouns, I am going to give you the pronunciation, tell you the meaning, as well as talk to you about how they're used in context. So let's just get this show on the road. The first noun is this one right here, quid pro quo. And it is three words. Each word is only one syllable. And if, if you're saying it together, the stress is, is kind of on that first word and that last word, quid pro quo. And what this means is it is something that, that is given or, or even taken in return for something else. So it's kind of like you, you, you're doing a favor for someone in exchange for something else, and that would be considered quid pro quo. Often we hear this when, when talking about politics. Somebody gives a politician money, and then that politician does something in return for them, and they would refer to it as quid pro quo. Quid pro quo, Mr. Powers. I need some quid pro quo from you. Quid pro quo, I tell you things, you tell me things. Maybe you're negotiating with somebody and you're like, you know, I'm going to need a little quid pro quo if I do whatever favor it is for you. If you want us to donate to your campaign, we'll need some quid pro quo. The next noun, which is one of my favorites, is catch 22. This is two words. It's a compound noun. The word catch is just one syllable, and then 22 is three syllables, and the stress is on that final syllable. Catch 22. The word comes from a famous book by Joseph Heller, which is titled Catch 22. And the meaning of a catch 22, see if you can follow me, is it is a problem that cannot be solved because the solution to the problem is inherent in the problem itself. Now, you may be thinking, what the heck are you talking about? And it's often referred to situations where, again, you can't solve the problem because the solution is within the problem itself. And it's just like this circular loop. So this is a, a great noun to describe this type of situation. And again, it's just like a standalone statement. When you are tough, they resent you. And when you are cool, they walk all over you. Catch 22. There's no unspoken thing. Well, it's a catch-22 because if you said it, then it would be spoken. Part of their parole is that they're required to have a job. The catch-22 of it is not that many people are that excited to hire a felon. We don't really use this noun with any adjectives. It's just really that standalone statement. And you would describe something and say, it's a catch-22. Next is epitome. And this noun has four syllables and the stress is on that second syllable, epitome. This is a word that when you see it, many times people may mispronounce it because the third syllable has that schwa and the last syllable is that long e, epitome, epitome. And what it means is a, a person or thing that is, that is typical of a, a class or, or group as a whole, something that possesses to, to the highest degree what, what this whole group is all about. And therefore, we, we say that something is the epitome of something else, kind of giving an example, saying that this thing best represents this whole group. It's the epitome of something. Interactive English is the epitome of English teaching excellence. And if you agree with that statement, then go ahead and, and hit that like button down below. It's, it's kind of like a quid pro quo. I teach you new nouns, you hit that like button. It, it's a fair exchange. Another great noun is dichotomy. 
This word has four syllables and the stress is on that second syllable. Dichotomy. And that third syllable, it has that schwa, that uh sound. Dichotomy. What it means is the division or, or contrast between two things that are represented as being opposed or entirely different. So let me give you a couple examples uh, of a dichotomy. You could have science and religion. Two things that you can compare and, and they're kind of opposed to each other in, in some ways. Also city life and country life. Completely different, but we can still compare them. And when using this noun, you, you say the two things that, that you're comparing. Dichotomy of good and evil. The tired dichotomy of jock artists. Often we use it with the preposition between. You talk about the dichotomy between two things. For example, we could say, we're studying the dichotomy between economic development and environmental protection. The next noun is myriad. This word has three syllables and the stress is on that first syllable. That M-Y-R sounds like a mir, myriad. And a myriad is a very great or indefinitely great number of things. Often it can be used as a synonym for various. You talk about a myriad of something. There's a lot of variety. There's a great number of these things. There's a myriad. There is a myriad of trees in the forest. The next noun is credence. This word has two syllables and the stress is on that first syllable, credence. And what it means is the belief as as to the truth of something that you're kind of there's a belief and it's showing that that belief is true i never gave these stories much credence he's a criminal and a terrorist people aren't going to give him credence and uh though we we give them no credence at all larry and often you may find this noun with the verb give something gives a belief credence it, it makes it seem a little more true for example the email they discovered gave credence to his unethical behavior. Next is malaise. This word has two syllables and the stress is on that second syllable, malaise. And this is not a great noun. The reason I say this is because its meaning is a, a vague feeling of physical discomfort or uneasiness as an early sign of an illness. So if somebody is, is just starting to feel ill, then it, it's very possible that they might experience malaise. I experienced bad headaches and malaise before deciding to go to the doctor. The next noun is sycophant. And this noun has three syllables and the stress is on that first syllable. The spelling may throw people off to the pronunciation, but that S-Y-C is just pronounced sick, sycophant. And the meaning of a sycophant is a person that, that tries to gain attention by flattering wealthy or, or influential people. So this is not a good noun. You don't want somebody to call you a sycophant because it basically means you're, you're sucking up to somebody else for no real reason. And it's pathetic. Yeah, it's not good. Some sycophants in the media refuse to acknowledge the political corruption. Another great noun, which is another one of my favorites, is a dilettante. And this word has three syllables, and th there's kind of like a, a stress on that first and last syllable, dilettante. The, the reason I say it's one of my favorites is because I guess, you know, I, I could be considered a, a dilettante. Uh, many of us can be considered dilettantes because its meaning is a person that that cultivates an interest in something without really learning in-depth information. And I think this just happens with people all the time. We become interested in a topic and we learn a little bit about it so that we can converse with our friends and have discussions, but we, we have difficulty really debating this topic with facts and information because we just don't know enough. They will remain dilettantes in war and tourists in Vietnam. What's your point? Your knowledge is a mile wide and an inch deep. Do you know what that makes you? A dilettante. But if somebody calls you a dilettante, then it's probably not in a good sense because they're, they're probably referring to you saying that, well, you're a person that you think you know a lot, but you really don't. You want to think she knows a lot about health and nutrition, but she's really a dilettante. The next noun is zenith. Has two syllables and the stress is on the first syllable, zenith. And 
When talking about the zenith, you are talking about the top, the peak, the highest point or state uh, of something or, or someone's condition. So if you are at the top, the highest point, then you are at the zenith. It basically implies that you're not going to go any higher. So it's like saying you've, you've reached the top, you're not going to go any higher, and things are, are just going to start going downhill from here. His athletic career has reached its zenith. So I hope some of these nouns were, were new for you, and now that you've learned them, you can go out and practice using them so that you can improve your overall English fluency. But if you really want to improve your English fluency, I highly recommend you check out our secret lesson. I've linked it in the description below. It's so secret, we're going to email it to you. If you enjoyed this lesson, hit that like button, you know, that quid pro quo we have going on. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.